this session. Hello. <laughs> Thanks everyone for coming, uh, especially for your last session of DrupalCon this year. Um, this session is decoupled Drupal with Silex. Uh, if that's not what you're here for, you're in th then one of us is in the wrong room, and I don't think both of us are wrong, so. Uh, my name is Larry Garfield. You may know me online as Krell. If you want to make fun of me during the session on Twitter, that's where you do so. I'm a senior architect with Palantir.net. We're a web <laughs> development shop based in Chicago in the United States. Um, we do mostly Drupal work, some Symfony uh, work as well. Um, for Drupal 8, it was the Web Services Initiative lead, uh, Drupal representative to the fr PHP Framework Interoperability Group. It's kind of the United Nations of PHP with all the positive and negative connotations that has. Uh, advisor of the Drupal Association and general purpose lovable pedant. So, that's me. Uh, my name is Hagen Nast. I'm a senior solutions architect at uh, Uyala. Not as many titles as somebody else has. Um, <laughs> but let me tell you a little bit about Uyala. We are one of the leading uh, online video platform providers. Um, company got founded in 2007, so we've been around for a while. Uh, we have by now over 300 employees worldwide. Um, global footprint of about 200 million unique uh, users in 130 countries. Um, so we do know video. Um, and we're working with um, some of the biggest and most successful broadcast and media companies uh, in the world. Um, short list of those here. I'm sure that uh, some of you have watched video of that on at least one of those sites. For this specific project, um, we wanted to build a um, content management system <coughs> for an OTT solution. Um, OTT? OTT, good question. Um, over the top video solution. So think Netflix type um, video service. The, um, some of the features that we gave um, Palantir to develop were that we wanted to support a really structured, uh, well-structured uh, data model uh, for the metadata for the video. Um, we, of course, wanted a UI to manage the actual metadata. Um, we wanted to implement a workflow to, for the publishing of uh, videos. It's very important because the quality of data that you typically get from the studios is not all that great. So. <clears throat> There's at least two steps in that specific workflow. First, a QA workflow, a QA step, and then um, the actual publishing uh, to the service. Uh, we wanted to curate content as well. Um, some of it, um, like lists and collections that could be displayed on the applications and websites, uh, banners for the websites, um, and then some application um, CMS kind of aspects came in it as well. Um, editing the home page um, and then list of lists for other parts of the web website and um, not just oh, yeah in addition sync the data with um, Uyala's existing dam digital asset management sy uh, system um, because we need some data in there as well um, and on top of that APIs that work at scale because we didn't just want to drive uh, websites uh, but also applications on different uh, devices. Um, the service had to support thousands of movies uh, and TV shows, tens of thousands of users, um, and as I mentioned, you have websites and applications. So yeah, we'd worked with, uh, Palantir had worked with Yellow before, um, and they came back to us and, and described this project that they wanted to do for one of their customers. And we said, do you want us to build Netflix in a box in Drupal? Cool, sounds fun. So, come on. So we put together uh, our team uh, for this project. Our project manager was uh, Amy Dosimo. Our senior engineers were myself and Robin Berry. And then uh, Beth Binkovitz and Beck White were on the engineering team as well. Uh, this was, you know, one of the complexities for this project was that there was no front end. We were, were not actually building the user facing part of the system in Drupal. We were not even building the user facing part of the system, period. We all wanted us to build a content management system that served a REST API, and that's it. And then web application, mobile application, whatever, could consume that data. And you know, we looked at this case, and all right, so we've got data that we need to bring in and do content management-y type stuff on it, and then serve it out as a REST API. You know, there's a system that is really, really good at that. You know what that is? Drupal 8. 
Except we were saying this in early 2013. So no, there wasn't Drupal 8. Eh. All right. So what do we do? This is a bit more than our usual, oh good, let's just throw up a Drupal site kind of approach. Uh, so we looked at, all right, we could use Drupal 7 with a services module. Problem, services is not actually a REST system. It's an RPC type uh, approach. And architecturally, it's fighting against Drupal 7 because Drupal 7 architecturally wants everything to be a page. And so it's not gonna be that performant. It's gonna be kind of clunky, lots of moving parts that don't need to be there. Um, there's the REST WS module. Uh, who, who's used REST WS? A few people. In early 2013, it still was very new and kind of experimental. We didn't want to do that much with it. Um, but you know, it has since become kind of the model for Drupal 8's REST module. But at this point, you know, when we built this project, it wasn't a serious option. Another option we considered was, let's just do it ourselves and go all Symfony with it. You know, at that point, we knew that Drupal 8 was adopting a lot of Symfony components. Symfony is a good framework for doing custom bespoke applications. You know, why not use that? And you know, we spent a lot of time <laughs> wrestling with that question of, is Drupal even the right platform for it? And what we came down to on um, this one was, do we want it to spend the extra time ramping up on Symfony? Do we want this to be our first Symfony project and learn all of the piece of Symfony and have to build the UI from scratch? Drupal does give you an awful lot out of the box in terms of content management that you know, when you start using some other system, you realize just how much you're missing that you just take for granted in Drupal. And we kind of wanted to take that stuff for granted in Drupal. Uh, and then we looked at another option, Silex. Who's, who's worked with Silex before? Good number of you, okay. So you, you probably, those of you can probably see why we're looking at it. It's kind of Symphony Junior. It's a, a lightweight system built on the same um, the same components as uh, Symfony and as Drupal 8. So a lot of commonalities there. Uh, it's actually very fast. I did some quick, quick benchmarks for serving a REST response, just a little hello world level REST response. And Silex was three times faster than Drupal 7. And that's before we did any optimization of any kind. <clears throat> um, downside there though, it's a micro framework. So it would do even less for us out of the box than Symfony would, and so that's even more we'd, we would have to do ourselves. None of these looked like the right platform to build this system on. So, all right, let's combine. Drupal 7, its strong advantages are as a content management system and displaying pages and displaying administrative screens. And it's really good at that, but Drupal 7 is kind of lame for REST uh, services, truth. Silex, on the other hand, that's the Silex logo. I, what, one of the nice things is they both have kooky eyes, so they work well together as projects. But Silex is really, really good at ha HTTP handling. It's you know, raw Symfony, which is a very strong API for dealing with web services. Uh, the downside, of course, is that any kind of UI you want is going to be hand-rolled, artisanal, from scratch. You know, you're responsible for every tag in the markup. So let's just combine them because, you know, leverage the right tool for the job. There's a lot of jobs here, so let's use multiple tools. So how do we get these talking to each other? If you're talking about Drupal 8 instead, you know, they're all using Symfony so you can stack them, but we needed these to talk to each other somehow. So how do we get data from Drupal to Elasticsearch to serve the API? Uh, well, Dr Drupal's data uh, lives in in Drupal, and it has its own very specific structure. But the structure that you need for editing is not the same as what we wanted to serve on the API. We had, you know, the, the, you want to have editors ed, edit content in these three chunks, but serve them as one chunk uh, to end users, or vice versa. And so instead, we decided, let's put Elasticsearch in the middle. Let Drupal control Drupal content and let uh, Silex do APIs, and the only place they have to talk to each other is in um, Elasticsearch. So who's worked with Elasticsearch before? Good number of people. Who saw the Elasticsearch session here at the conference or earlier? Completely different set of people. So now everyone understands Elasticsearch now, right? <laughs> okay. 
Uh, this was actually the first time we used Elasticsearch, um, but from what we understood, it's the same underlying engine as Apache Solar, which Drupal uses uh, all the time. It's the Lucene engine, but its API is a lot easier to work with than Solar's. Uh, so if you're doing custom developments, we have found, you know, we have done custom development on Solar projects as well, and we found Elasticsearch just way easier to develop against as you know, people <coughs> writing uh, against it. <coughs> um, you know, the, the JSON API is a lot easier to work with. The fact that you can mess around with the schema for it without restarting the server and re-indexing all data was very nice. Um, just if you're doing custom developments, I recommend Elasticsearch as your search server. It's just a lot easier to work with. So we ended up with this pipeline then for the system where we'd have some kind of incoming XML from the customer that is the definition of um, some movie or TV show or whatever, you know, the metadata that we, we need to be managing. And we import that into Drupal. And content editors in Drupal could then edit it, update it, you know, make sure that nothing is misspelled, uh, make sure the image is the right image for this, you know, the right poster image for this video. You really don't want to put you know, an R-rated movie's poster image on a kid's movie by accident. That's just a bad idea, trust me. Drupal then would dump that its data into Elasticsearch, where Silex would read it and serve it out to whatever the API consumer is going to be, phone, website, whatever. And all right, there's a lot of moving parts here, but you know, we really just broke it down into three sections. So our data model itself, uh, I'm not gonna go into too much detail on, but you know, this is Drupal node modeling, and you've all done this a dozen times. In our case, uh, the major content, we had programs, which they, you know, record for a movie or a TV show or, or whatever. The asset, which is the wrapper around the actual video file. We were not storing the actual video files. That's what Uyala's backlot service was for. And we're, we're just really just doing the browsing system for it. Uh, offers, which are the thing you can actually buy that give you access to uh, some movie for some period of time. And then stuff like collections and lists like Hagen mentioned for other curatorial stuff. And again, I'm not gonna go into too much detail, it's just we had bunches of, bunches of nodes. Um, so where's the data coming from? We're not entering it manually because that would be slow. Instead, the uh, customer is sending us content in XML form. And that XML looks something like this. Please don't be scared. Um, you don't, I don't want you to understand all of this, uh, but the thing I wanna call out is this one XML file includes several of those content types wrapped up together. So like most of this is part of the program. Uh, so down here in the video, this is actually the asset. And we also have like the exhibition window here is the, what helps define the offer. Um, and we also had device filtering. So certain devices can access certain content. So we had to work that in as well. And all of that was coming in as one big XML file. So how do we break that up? <coughs> so importing process, what are the options in Drupal? Well, there's the migrate module, and problem. Migrate's designed to run user triggered, like from, uh, from in Drupal, you push a button, or you run a Drush script or something like that, which is great for the use case it's designed for, but we wanted to accept you know, pushed data from the customer. They, we wanted them to be able to push ingested data to us so that we, you know, they can just th keep throwing data at us and we'll consume it. So that wasn't an option. We thought about feeds. Um, problem is feeds really wants to map things to one object and we needed to map to multiple objects. It also has an awful lot of moving parts, uh, some of which are better built than others. We have worked with feeds in the past uh, for Drupal to Drupal communication, but we didn't want that uh, overhead on this project. <coughs> Um, services, again, kind of clunky, not really restful, um, and we didn't want to add more and more layers to the project than we needed to. So, went custom with this, and it ended up working out really well. And by custom, I just mean a custom module. Um, so, we uh, just parsed the XML with a library called QueryPath. Who's used QueryPath? There's a Drupal module for it. Wow, I'm impressed with a lot of people. Okay. 
So for those not familiar with it, think um, jQuery for, uh, yeah, jQuery for PHP. It's actually a really nice little library. Uh, and with that, we had uh, a little import engine we built using just standard PHP 5.3 tools. So yeah, if you want to get into the developer parts of it, who's seen my functional programming talk before? I've given it at a couple of Drupal cons. The example I use out of that for the import engine is from this project. So f for those of you who recognize that, um, that's what it is. And that gives us one XML file comes in, a bunch of nodes come out, we call node save. And it's nice and simple, uh, even testable, yay uh, object-oriented programming. <clears throat> so we've got that import engine wired up to, to, to Drupal. And yeah, we said Drupal 7 is terrible at REST, but that's okay. All we need is posts. So we're not actually doing REST for this part. Um, so we just had a couple of custom page callbacks, straight up Drupal behavior, Drupal API, um, <coughs> to just shuffle data from the incoming request to these, uh, to, to that importer. Um, and we did add SSL authentication for it because we didn't want anyone in the world to be able to shove data into the system. Who'd have thunk it? Um, so use just simple HTTP auth module. I think that's the correct name. Um, that lets us restrict access uh, with HTTP auth, and then we throw uh, SSL on it. Actually, HTTP basic, and then throw SSL on it, uh, just for selected paths. Great. So we've got all of our data. We've got all the data we're going to need. Almost. Problem is that that XML file I showed is often missing stuff because the customer in this case had an awful lot of data that wasn't very good. So all right, we've got to fill in this data somehow. We, how are we going to get replacement data? Do we make someone just sit there and edit it all the time? You know, and, and they have to come up with a new synopsis for these movies? That's a waste of a human being's time. So instead, we need to talk to a third-party service and bring in some kind of third-party data. And in this case, uh, the customer uh, contracted with Rotten Tomatoes, the website. They're, uh, if you know IMDb, they're kind of like that. Um, but they have actually a really nice API to get at the content in their system for uh, movie information, reviews on movies, uh, other information like that. Um, and they do offer, you know, it's a it's a free API for a certain level of usage and uh, paid API over that. So the customer paid for a uh, paid API, great, slot the credentials in and start uh, talking to that. So to actually talk to it, uh, we use the Guzzle library. Guzzle, for those not familiar, is an HTTP uh, client for Drupal. So who's used uh, Drupal, H Drupal HTTP request in Drupal 7? Okay, it no longer exists in Drupal 8 because it is the second most impossible to, de to debug and maintain piece of code in the universe. And I, there's actually been measurements done of that, and it's, its signal of complexity is obscene, so we didn't even want to touch it. Uh, but Guzzle is the library that Drupal 8 is using. It's a third-party PHP library, and Drupal 8's just pulling it in, great. And so we said, if it's good enough for Drupal 8, it's good enough for us. So I uh, brought that in. And then wrote a standalone Guzzle library, a Guzzle extension, to talk to the Rotten Tomatoes API. And you know, this is a link. It, it's actually a standalone Guzzle extension that uh, we've released on GitHub uh, as just an open source library that lets you talk to uh, Rotten Tomatoes and just load node obj um, movie objects out of it and review objects out of it, navigate between them. Um, just f nice little wrapper around their API. And then a Drupal module that we've also released that leverages that and provides a mapping from their data to Drupal. Solve one problem in each of these little pieces along the way. What this means is we can then say, all right, we've updated this movie, link it up by its IMDb ID, because Rotten Tomatoes uses the IMDb you know, unique identifier as their unique identifier because Monopoly, I don't know. Uh, and so when we say save a node in Drupal, it has, you know, it's a movie, it has a, an IMDb ID on it. We go out to Rotten Tomatoes, uh, fetch its data, and just map that into a parallel node in Drupal. So now we have, you know, the Dark Knight 
the movie from our customer and The Dark Knight, the movie from Rotten Tomatoes, sitting in our database. And then we can periodically, you know, refetch it if we need to, to keep data fresh on save or on cron and various business logic around that. But the system was set up in such a way we can vary that whenever we want to. <coughs> um, and then we also brought in reviews. So something in the, using the API wants to look at a movie and, okay, what's the, what are the reviews on it? How good is it? That data is coming from Rotten Tomatoes. Okay. So now we've got all this data in Drupal. What are we going to do with it? You know, we edit it, and Drupal's good at that, right? Almost. Drupal's node edit page, especially in Drupal 7, can get very large and unwieldy if you have as many, you know, as complex a data set as we had here. So we had to do a bit of custom work on this one. Um, so the main uh, admin interface, this is straight up views. You know, if you're doing any kind of uh, custom work in Drupal, you want to build a custom admin, views as your go-to tool. You rarely even need to theme it. Uh, so in this case, we're showing all the data that we imported. So there's the one of the offers. Here's the corresponding program. Uh, yeah, that's, so there's the movie Brave from Disney and the, uh, the offer information for it. Somewhere down here is some uh, the actual assets. And we've got the QA state, published review state. These are just fields on the node as well. Um, there's a lot of data in here. It's going to be thousands of movies. So fortunately, Views offers really nice filtering. You know, there's really nothing custom going on here. This is nice and simple. Separate page to show uh, the in Drupal content. So collections that people create, our uh, custom lists, and, and so forth. Uh, you know, banner images and stuff like that that are going to get shown. Um, the fun part is the actual node edit experience which this is not what your normal node edit page looks like. What we wanted to do was offer not, here's a dump of the entire huge, uh, huge node, but here are the pieces of it and how they relate to each other. So in this case, we're showing the overview for the dark, oh, wrong button, Dark Knight program. And we've got some information on it here, but also, you know, like here's the uh, curatorial status of this data. And here's the offer it relates to, and here's the other, you know, the asset it relates to. So an administrator can at a glance see, all right, this whole movie in, the, in total is ready to be published. It's ready to be approved. <coughs> then we have, um, you know, an over, overview page. I made the screenshots recently, so there normally would be a preview of the video here, but my current dev copy doesn't have a connection anymore. So imagine there's a video screen here. Um, but you can see you know, wh when this was imported, you get you know, the current QA state. So certain users with certain roles can uh, prove it. That's just normal Drupal access control like we're all used to. Um, put in you know, a log message for you know, why it's being rejected. We had some custom form alters behind the scene to say the log message is only required if this field is, uh, is failed for some reason. Um, then the actual information itself can shows below that, including, you know, very sized thumbnails of the actual uh, poster images. Those are all just being created by Drupal image styles. And that's actually the images we then serve out uh, to the public. And it, it goes down further. This is the, the overview page. And this is all built with panels. So we did all of this custom UI work with panels and a couple of uh, form alters, essentially. <coughs> it's a bit more than that, but when I say a couple of form alters, I'm sure a few people are chuckling at that, yeah. For editing, then, we broke it up into several different screens. Rather than one gigantic uh, edit page, you can edit different parts of the record, different parts of the node. Uh, so in this case, we're editing just the credit information. So that's the, you know, who's the director, who's the writer, who's the, the actress on it, and so on. And um, so we've got a QA state for the record. We've got the uh, switch between the different credit sources. So on this piece of content, I trust the incoming data from the customer's uh, data source. And on this piece of content, that data source is crap. So I'm going to use the information from Rotten Tomatoes instead. And you can make that decision on a per node basis. And it's really just you know saving a Boolean or a, a toggle in the database for now and showing 
both the uh, incoming data and the Rotten Tomatoes data. Then you can edit the you know, the, uh, generic uh, content. There's a couple of other fields, again, built with panels. Uh, this is a very long page. I'm not going to bore you with the whole thing. But you can see you know, all this metadata and information that's in the incoming data that they want to be able to expose in the API and then build whatever filtering around uh, in client applications. <laughs> Synopsis, again, same idea. You know, use the uh, incoming data or use Rotten Tomatoes. And you can make that, different, that distinction differently from the, um, the credit data or the other metadata. And again, this is just for now, we're just storing a, a flag as part of the node. It's just a field. Um, I said this is built with panels. Who's tried to override uh, node edit forms with panels? It's painful, isn't it? That's why I say there were a couple of form alters. I'm papering over an awful lot of there that I don't want to go into too much detail on. It, it would bore most of the room. Um, most of it came down to doing black magic around the uh, required fields. So they were required only on certain pages because Drupal 7 really, really, really doesn't like you doing this. So th these are all panels using node edit as a, a context. This is actually right around the time uh, while we were working on this project that uh, the concept of form modes went into Drupal 8, which is basically this thing, this concept built into core out of the box as a fully supported feature. So if you want to do this kind of interface in Drupal 8, it should be a lot easier now. Are we putting this thing to Drupal 8, Hagen? Yeah, it's unfortunate. <laughs> so this is what editors actually see. And again, we just threw the seven theme on everything. We didn't, there was no front end. We had no themers on this project. Who was in the uh, developer versus themer uh, session earlier? A few people, yeah. So we bypassed that fight by not having any themers on the project. <laughs> okay, so we've got the data and we've got it curated, we've got it edited, we know what we're gonna do with it. Now what? Now we get to the decoupled part. This is headless Drupal in a sense, because when a node is, re is ready, we dump it out to Elasticsearch. Problem, this actually takes a while, because as we said, the data structure we want in Drupal is not the same as the data structure we want in the API. Do we want to reformat that data every time it's requested by a user? Absolutely not, that would be horribly slow. So instead, uh, you know, we, we wanted to do yeah, I'll, I'll back up a moment. Uh, we also, the contrib module support for Elasticsearch uh, in Drupal in 2013 was rather poor. It has since gotten a lot better. There's modules that have been released since then uh, that actually use the supported um, API uh, libraries from Elasticsearch, the company. Um, and we looked at rules to do this pre-processing and Again, too many moving parts, not enough places we can hook in and do, I just want to write some code. A lot of this project was, this is easier if I just write code. Fortunately, Drupal lets you just write code. Um, and we also have this interesting problem where sometimes when you export one node, you have to export some other node, but only conditionally. So you export a program, you have to also, export, uh, also publish its, um, the corresponding asset, but some pieces of the asset we want moved onto the program and some pieces of the program we just delete. So we had to have somewhere to do this kind of logic, uh, including merging in that Rotten Tomatoes content. So if you're exporting a program and it's Toggle is set to use Rotten Tomatoes for the source for the synopsis, we need to pull in the data at that time, which means loading up the Rotten Tomatoes node, pulling the data off of that, putting that into the, the information we're exporting to Elasticsearch instead of what's in the node we're about to export. Complicated, right? Great. Another little custom system. It's actually not that hard to do in Drupal if you go object-oriented with it, because then you're not coupled to Drupal and you know, object per uh, node type. This ended up being a very simple, very robust way to handle it. <coughs> so, all right, now when are we going to export content? What are the publication rules? We, do we want to export content before it's been uh, approved by an editor, that would be a terrible idea. So let's not do that. So we made the decision that if, some, if a note is published, that means it's going to be public. 
It's, it's ready for public consumption. And if it's ready for public consumption, we're going to push it out to Elasticsearch. So if it's published, we push it to Elasticsearch. If it's unpublished, we don't push it to Elasticsearch. Nice and simple. So when is a node ready to be public? When it's been approved? Well, it's a bit more than that. A program is publishable when it's been approved by an editor with some caveats. An offer is uh, publishable when it's been approved and it's within a publication window because you know, we may only have a license to sell this movie during the month of May or only in certain regions and so on. And so we only want to publish it within its publication window and maybe a few weeks before that so people know it's coming or maybe a few days after. Mm. It's more complicated than I'm making it out to be. For an asset, for the actual information about the video itself, when it's been approved, and it has an offer that's been approved, because if there's no offer for it, no sense publishing that information, or the offer is within its publication window because then we can talk about it, but you can't actually buy it yet. Eh. It's complicated. Let's just go with that. And we don't want to do complicated when people save nodes. When you save a node, its publication status may change, and <clears throat> that's a terrible, terrible time to do all this complicated logic. Because then we slow down the UI, the editor using the site needs to sit and wait for two seconds every time they hit save as we try and figure out if the node should be published, and if so, which other nodes that we publish with it. And that would be a terrible, terrible thing for the user. So let's not do that. Instead, we used uh, Drupal's Q system and cron. So they spent all of that hard work of computing, do we need to publish this thing, do we not need to publish it, what else do we publish, how do we reformat the data, all of that only ever happened in a queue. That's the only time it happened, which means it's completely out of band from the user, the user responsiveness is like that, because all we're doing when you save a node is tossing an item into a queue to say, by the way, check this node when you get a chance. Um, so, like on cron, we would say, find nodes that we think are, are ready to be published based on their time windows and so forth, as SQL queries, and find nodes that, because now something else is about to be published, I uh, gotta get that one, and throw it all into a queue. And do the same thing with nodes that are about to go out of their window. Just find them, toss them into a queue, come back to them later. This is the exact same model that uh, Core uses for things like the aggregator module. Uh, and it's, I think Drupal 8 does it even more, where if you have hard work you want to do, but it's the same thing a lot, Q, you know, use uh, a cron hook to say, all right, it's been an hour, it's been a half hour, whatever, grab all of the things I need to update, need to check, throw them into a queue, and then just let the queue figure it out. And the queue will just churn through them at whatever rate it can, and you know, update each feed, publish each node, whatever. And then, um, you know, Pub, those will just toggle the publish and unpublish states, if appropriate. That triggers a node save. Node save triggers another queue that says, all right, we've just saved the node, which, uh, so go do the pushing to the elastic search you need to do. And then if it's published, we do all our, that fancy processing to reformat the data and merge content and so on and so forth, <coughs> and send that to elastic search, and if not, we delete it. <coughs> That way, again, the hard work is all happening here and here. Never in node save. Node save becomes cheap. We have these sets of run very frequently, so I think it's like a five minute uh, time. If you want, you can even use a running queue module. We didn't here, so queues are just always processing. Um, another after, uh, aspect of this is it's quite possible if you save a node and then edit something and save it again a minute later, that a node will end up in the queue multiple times. <coughs> That's not actually a problem in this case because you know, what, what's the worst thing that happens? We delete a node from Elasticsearch twice. Elasticsearch doesn't care. Or we push the same node to Elasticsearch twice. Elasticsearch doesn't care. So overwrites and, and overwriting to Elasticsearch um, was a non-issue, so we just ignored that. We don't care. If we process something multiple times, we don't care. So now our content's on, in Elasticsearch. Now what? Now we get to Silex. Now we get to the non-Drupal bits. This is just serving a, uh, 
an API, just serving a REST API. So there is no user interface. We didn't actually get to play with Twig on that project. It was sad. Silex is a very, very simple, lightweight micro framework. It gives you a routing system, some glue, and the ability to register callbacks. And that's about it. And that's all we needed. Everything else you build yourself. And so we built it ourselves. It's using the same uh, core pipeline, as I said before, as uh, Symfony and it's Drupal 8. So we already had some familiarity with that based on uh, watching Drupal 8 uh, happen. And you know, uh, unlike Symfony full stack, which gives you a whole ton of stuff, it gives you Twig out of the box, it gives you Doctrine, it gives you whatever, or Drupal, which gives you all this functionality. Silex, you add what you want. It's a very minimalist system out of the box. So we added Elastica, which is an open source PHP library for talking to Elasticsearch, which is the same one we used in Drupal, in fact. Guzzle, uh, to talk back to Uyala's backlot dam on occasion when we needed to. And uh, this HAL library. HAL stands for Hypertext Application Language. It's a uh, JSON spec. <coughs> uh, it's an IETF draft currently. It's a very simple extension to JSON that uh, provides hypermedia links. So you can actually build a RESTful API with it. It's actually really, really nice. And it's what Drupal 8 uses out of the box. And it's what um, like Zend App Agility uses out of the box. It's really <laughs> becoming quite popular. Uh, and th there's an XML favor of it, but I don't know anyone that uses it. <coughs> Fun little story, actually. Um, February of last year, of uh, 2013, I was at another conference in Miami. And we, I was going, going to the on-site with Uyala as soon as I got back. While I was there, Lynn Clark, fr who was from the Drupal, rest, Drupal 8 REST team, emailed me to say, Larry, this thing we've been trying to do with Drupal 8 using JSON-LD is not going to work. I suggest we switch to HAL. And at Sunshine PHP, the, the conference, there was a presenter talking about building their entire company on HAL and showing some of the, the benefits of HAL as a format and the tool chain around it. And I came away from those two inputs saying, so Hagen, this API we're building for you, let's use HAL for it. So this, we used HAL on this at the exact same time that we were switching Drupal 8 over to HAL as well. So they, they nicely played off each other. So what are we doing in Silex? <clears throat> Again, I'm not going to get into code, but it's a very, very simple pipeline because Silex is simple and all we needed to do was suck data out of Elasticsearch and serve it. And that's it. Pull data out, format it, and serve it. So we've got you know, the routing system that happens in, in uh, Symfony or in Silex or in Drupal. Um, load data out of a little rep uh, repository wrapper rebuilt around Elasticsearch. Get that data back, convert it to a HAL object, and return it from the controller. And then in a view listener, which is the kind of post step in a Symfony application, we take that HAL object and convert it to an actual JSON string. We actually support XML2 on it because it took an extra three lines of code to do that um, and did all of that hard work there. And then also <coughs> H uh, HTTP caching. Fun fact, we're actually moving to this exact same model in Drupal 8 of doing all, you know, return an actual object here and um, you know, then do the hard work in the view listener. That's what Drupal 8 is going to be doing internally, based in large part on our experience in this project, convincing us that this was a good way to do it. So this was this played into Drupal 8's architecture, in fact. <coughs> um, and then you know, all, all the HTTP caching is, you know, it's easy to do in Symfony. They've got the tools there for it. We don't do any caching at all in the Silex application. There's not one bit of caching in there. HTTP takes care of everything. One of the nice things about HAL, I'd say the best thing about HAL, is that there's this nice HAL browser available for it. This is a simple, downloadable, single-page app that lets you browse any arbitrary HAL API. As long as it's well-structured, you can browse through the API entirely. So this is the, the index API. So a, a client application only ever hard codes this URL, domain name slash or domain name slash API or whatever it's going to be. And then there's various links that you can traverse just like a web page to get to uh, some other resource. This is how you navigate around a uh, REST API. This is the proper way of building REST APIs. 
some of these you need to do a, a device API on, like we said before. A lot of other complexity I'm just kind of, you know, wave over for the moment. But if we followed the link to a program, this is what a program looks like. And the full response that comes back is it's over here. This is the actual structure of the content itself. It's just a blob of JSON, cleaned up, formatted the way we want. Some bits of it look like Drupal, some don't. That's fine. Yeah, this is something we negotiate with the team that's doing the front end. Um, you can have a look at all of the headers come back for debugging. Like in this case, we're in dev mode, so there's no caching turned on. In uh, production, we turn on caching. <coughs> um, and from that, you can actually just follow the link to a person who was on this uh, this program, an actor who was in this uh, on this um, on this in this movie. So in this case, we're following it off to Heath Ledger. And we've got links back here that you can traverse back to movies that person has acted in. Which means in a client application, it becomes really, really easy to say, all right, I want to find movies that this actor was in. So I look up that actor object, and I see, oh, here's the relationships to movies that this actor has been in. I will go get those. It's nice and simple. <clears throat> Navigating an, an API as if it were a web page by just traversing links around, that's how you do a proper REST API. That's actual hypermedia. <clears throat> and of course, you know, we wanted this to be highly available. We wanted this to not crash. We wanted it to be fast. We wanted it to be uh, stable. Fortunately, the Silex app is pretty much stateless. It has no state of its own other than the Elasticsearch server. So you spin up three or four of them, tell them where the Elasticsearch server is, and you're good to go. You've got three, four, five web heads that you can load balance very, very easily. And it, they are themselves very lightweight, too. Uh, Elasticsearch, as well, is almost disturbingly easy to set up in a uh, replication mode. You just spin up multiple Elasticsearch servers, give them the same ID, and it, they just work themselves out. So in production, we've got at least two Silex heads, at least two Elasticsearch servers, and then I believe we do have two Drupal servers. The Drupal servers are completely behind a firewall. It is not actually possible to get to them from the public web. The only thing you can get to is the Silex servers. Um, yeah, we actually had, uh, for Elasticsearch, one of the ad sysadmins at the client kept asking us, so how do we set up replication in Elasticsearch? And we said, you turn on a second Elasticsearch server and give it the same ID and it figures itself out. So how do you set up clustering with Elasticsearch? You spin up multiple servers and it figures itself out. So can you provide us documentation for spinning up clusters in Elasticsearch? You spin up multiple servers and it figures itself out. It was too easy for him to be able to grasp. Systems that are too easy for, to use for a, for a person to comprehend is a good sign. <clears throat> and then we stick Varnish in front of it. We're using HTTP caching. Varnish is an HTTP cache. Great. Everything we're doing is read-only. So nope. yeah. everything we're doing is read-only. So it'll cache just fine. If it's a little bit stale because of you know, updates from Drupal, we don't care. You know, five minute, 10 minutes uh, time window is fine, which means almost everything's getting served out of Varnish. Varnish is blazingly fast um, to the point that I think we just have the one Varnish server and that's not even load balanced because we don't need it to be. Right. Or is it load balanced for redundancy? I'm not actually sure. No, but um, yeah, we, performance was never actually an issue for us. Uh, so that's what we did. That's how we uh, put this thing together. So actually, Hagen, a year on now since we built this thing, how's it working out? Um, really well, actually. Um, the service no, <laughs> um, the service launched on, on web for desktop um, um, only. Shortly thereafter, they launched um, applications on Android and iOS as well, all running against the same API. Um, just recently, they launched uh, Chromecast also, again, without any changes to the actual APIs or the, the back end of the service. Um, yeah, unfortunately, we couldn't involve Palantir in building the um, website, but <laughs> maybe for the next project. Um, and um, the service is growing, um, highly reliable. Um, Larry told you all that's running it. Um, I don't know of any outage that actually happened, so, so far, knock on wood, perfect record. Um, 
library of thousands of assets. They're about to launch um, TV box sets, so they're adding um, high volume of TV shows. Um, thousands of subscribers, maybe not quite the numbers that they wanted yet, but uh, steadily growing and again, no issues in terms of the service running. Um, we're also still adding new features, like I just mentioned TV box sets that require a minor change in the, in, in the data model. Um, but the architecture in, in general held up, modular, it's easy to add and, and change things. And that's it. All right. So, thank you. <laughs> so, we have some time for questions. Uh, we can go deeper into the architecture or not as deep if you, if you want. Please use the microphone here in the middle of the room so it gets recorded. And, uh, you know, what, what do you want to know about, about this project that we haven't already covered? Here's somebody. I was, um, I was just wondering, what is the latency for, from pressing save to the content actually being available in the front end? Worst, I think it depends on what you set your cron uh, yeah. time to be and what you set your HTTP cache to be. I think... As of I was last on the project, they were both set to five minutes. So 10 minutes is your worst case scenario. Okay. Set that down to a minute and a minute, then two minutes is your worst case scenario. Okay. So, so it, you have no problem processing all the... the no. Oh, okay. No. Cool. And uh, one of the advantages of Drupal's uh, queue system is that is um, a synchronous, or it can be run synchronously. So if the cron got way too big, you spin up, you just run drush, uh, drush queue run or to queue process, whatever the command is, three or four times in separate windows, and it'll just burn through the whole thing okay. and shove it all out. So and when they get to processing that much data at once, spin up more uh, queue workers and you're good to go. You mentioned that you made the imports from XML files, and uh, I'm wondering if you had some tests made for those and if you, you had, how did you make the tests for or testing if the import is well done from the XMS? The way you would test that is just have sample files on hand and you know, run them through it and make sure nodes save at the end. Drupal 7 really doesn't make unit testing easy, um, so I, I think we just did integration tests level testing on that. Um, but we did have a bunch of sample files lying around that we could just run import on, make sure we got the nodes out the other end we want. If a new XML file is provided from the customer, which happened several times uh, with a slightly different format, and we've got the tests there already, tweak those for what we expect for the new content, tweak the, the mappings, keep running it, um, and you're good to go. So Drupal 7 means you do integration tests. It was simple tests, and I wish we could have done better, but Drupal 7. Yeah, I had the same. <laughs> that's why I asked. Yeah. Thank yeah, you. In, in Drupal 7, uh, that's pretty much all you can do. In Drupal 8, you can wrap most of that up in PHP unit tests uh, and then just do a, a simple wiring test at the top with a uh, simple test. Um, I was wondering what the added value of Elasticsearch was in your case. It's for search, uh, kind of search requests, because as you were caching everything anyway, uh, you could maybe have used the primary database as well? So we were actually doing keyword searches as well, and for that Elasticsearch was the obvious choice. And once we had that in there, it made sense to also use that to hold the denormalized data. Um, we technically could have uh, just used HTTP cache for everything. Again, problem there is um, anytime we pass through the cache, it's gonna be very expensive for that call and you know, whoever that user is, well, sucks to be them. Um, we didn't want that. Um, it, it also kept the systems decoupled. So the Drupal site can go down. We can take that offline to change the data model there. And as long as what gets pushed out to Elasticsearch doesn't change, we can just leave the Cyrix servers untouched. And technically, we can even re completely replace one or the other. We just have Elasticsearch in the middle. Um, yeah, it's, it's layers of separation and redundancy, as well as we actually were doing searching. No. Thanks. Mm, 
Did you care about invalidating the varnish cache or? We talked about that. We actually. Uh, I'm not sure if they actually implemented it. Yeah. Um, they were asking for it and we told them how to, but. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, in practice, the lifetime was short enough that the customer didn't care. Mm -hmm. uh, you certainly could do, um, you know, push an, an invalidation command to varnish if you wanted to. I think we had a user story for it. They just never wanted it because their timeline was short enough. But you certainly could do that. Yeah, so that, that was the other question I had, like the, the agile, agile approach you mentioned in the description of, the, of this. Yeah, this, this was actually the first pure agile project Palantir did, and it worked out really, really well. Um, yeah, the, the, probably the most important thing for an agile project is having a product owner that is active and aware and able to, you know, articulate and then adjust on the fly. And we had a really, really good product owner on this project. Um, what you're trying to say is I could make up <laughs> my mind and change things all the time. Yes, <laughs> yes but you were okay with that. Yeah. Um, and you know, so we had like the Rotten Tomatoes integration that we had talked about a little bit, but didn't actually figure out until halfway through the project, and that was okay because you know our contract and our product owner were structured in such a way that we could do that. Um, we also had handling around genres uh, for different assets, um, which are far more complicated than you would ever expect them to be. But we have the same problem of, we've got genres that come in from the source data, we've got genres that come in from Rotten Tomatoes, and sometimes one is good and not the other, and you want to change it, so, you know, the incoming genre is called action adventure, but you want to just use the word action, so you have to have mapping logic. We figured that out halfway through the project. We just paused, all right, let's just stop and take two days and figure this part out, rather than all that upfront design. Uh, so it actually worked out really, really well. This is the project that convinced me that Agile can actually work. <laughs> um, was there any consideration for using Node.js instead of um, Silex? We talked about it briefly, but we're a PHP shop, not a Node shop, and so we would have had to learn a completely new stack and a language that we spend less time in, and that wasn't worth it at that point. Uh, Silex was a shorter jump for us in terms of the technology stack t to learn. Okay. You certainly could do this kind of work with Node.js or um, you know, so something with Rails or Sinatra or something in Go or whatever you want on the other side of Elasticsearch. And that's kind of the point that, you know, that, that's independent of the Drupal part. <coughs> so, you know, they totally, you know, Uyala could totally junk that entire Silex piece and rebuild it from scratch with cool technology to Jure and nothing else needs to change. It's just a different thing pulling content out of Elasticsearch and serving it. You know, we'd be fine with that. That's, it was designed to support that kind of evolution. Uh, but yeah, the initial decision for Silex was we're a PHP shop, so let's use PHP. I right. guess that's it. So thank you everyone for coming. I um, uh, hope you enjoyed DrupalCon. Uh, do, do review this session uh, online. Uh, you can follow Palantir at Palantir, follow me at Crow. Hagen doesn't really use Twitter, so don't bother following him. <laughs> um, yeah, let's uh, enjoy the rest of your time in Amsterdam.